I've been hanging around on X Green Text for a while now, hearing about the monsters and the big feet and all the other spooky shit in the woods. But I have to ask, how does it all fit together? Not in a conspiracy sort of way, mind you. In an ecological sense, what are all these monsters eating? What do they need to survive? What happens when they meet one another? Are they hunting each other? Competing or what? I'm a wildlife biologist and I enjoy a good monster story and I like combining those two interests. So let's get into some theorizing and explain on how all of these monsters fit into the ecosystem they're from. We'll start simple. Crawlers, rakes, whatever the hell you want to call them. Gonna be honest, I'm not very impressed by these things. Yeah, they're fast, they're carnivores, they look like people, but all things considered, they're absolutely not anywhere near the top of the food chain. Crawlers are creepy, yeah, but they don't really have the muscle mass or the adaptations to take down big game. Deer, moose, boars, these are all monsters that weigh hundreds of pounds. For that kind of game, you need more than just a creepy smile and some claws. You need muscle, the lack of which is kind of one of these things' defining trait. The mouths are often described as small, not that good for inflicting a big deadly bite. Maybe a crawler could get the drop on a deer from above and get a kill, but it's not going to be a reliable source of food. The same goes for eating people, even if they're consistently chowing down on crackheads and lost kids. That's just not enough people out there to sustain a population of these things. The logical answer is that these things are well, like us, that is, generalists. They're almost certainly going after smaller meals that they can cram into their mouths or carry off. Birds or small mammals, fruit, maybe baby deer and shit. It's all stuff that requires them to move around constantly as they look for enough food to match the calories they're consuming as they chase you guys around. There's similar creatures like that today with shit like cougars and jumping spiders. Larger game isn't out of the question, but if they go for it, it's probably going to be relatively infrequent and the bodies are likely dragged up into trees as something as food caches, like leopards. Why? Because crawlers aren't alone in the woods, and there's shit that can eat them. Second thing with crawlers. There's a lot of shit that you guys claim is out there that can easily wreck a crawler's shit. Bigfoot and Dogman stick out particularly to me, but there's also a much more mundane beastie in the woods that can pretty soundly clap a crawler. Bears. I'm sorry. But there's no goddamn way that one of these chicken legged, rail thin, 100 pounds top motherfuckers is gonna come out on top against a full grown bear. These things are solid blocks of muscle, fur, and fuck you. The crawler just can't match to that. But it's not predation that I'm thinking about with bears, it's competition. Bears are gonna be eating the same thing a crawler's eating, and they're big enough that they can just wait out leaner times with build up fat deposits. But more importantly, they can handle the cold. A bear's got thick fur and hide, dense muscle, and layers of fat to keep it warm. Not to mention being able to just snap through snow. Crawlers? They don't really have anything to keep them from turning into ass naked popsicles. They're gonna need to find shelter from the snow, and that's gonna put them into further competition with bears. So how do we solve this problem? The crawlers seem up shit creek without a paddle. Until you remember two things. One, crawlers are climbers. That means they can make use of calves, much more so than bears. And what do you know? Major hotspots of crawler activity coincide with areas like the Appalachians and the Sierra Nevada mountains. Spots where there's tons of caves and tunnels. People go missing in these spots all the time, eaten by the hungry earth. But a crawler could navigate these tunnels easily, feeding on the carrion and keeping itself hidden throughout the harsher seasons without worrying about a grizzly rocking its shit. Which brings me to another factor, the fact that we wiped out most of the big predators of North America and filled the woods with homes for them. Abandoned buildings, crack dens, mine shaft, basements, hunting blinds, garden shed. We've crammed the goddamn woods full of places where a crawler would hide from the worst of the weather while simultaneously providing them with more food that they know they can easily access on a regular basis. Pets. Chicken coops, garbage dumps, food waste, even shit like food orchards and crop fields. And that stuff that gets tossed out there for not being good enough for consumers. It's all stuff that could easily feed generalist creatures like crawlers. And they're absolutely smart enough to figure that out. Especially given that they don't seem to be afraid of people. What's more, we also handily wiped out most of their major predators and competitors. Bears and wolves and cougars used to spread from coast to coast. But now, they're reduced to just a handful of spots. It's the same process that led the coyotes conquering the continent 
And honestly, those animals seem to be a pretty good model for the crawler. They're not unkillable super monsters. They're coyotes that happen to be shaped like people. Of course, there's also the question, what the fuck are all of these things eating? That's a bit complicated. Until relatively recently, North America had an absolute shitload of big prey items and equally big predators. Horses, camels, mastodons, mammoths, saber-toothed cats, lions, mega condors, all sorts of shit. Problem is, most of these prehistoric animals would have also been able to wipe the floor with Inuit shit, while at the same time preventing a lot of their preferred habitat from taking hold. Huge animals curate the forest that they live in, bulldozing young trees and undergrowth. Given that most Ice Age megafauna are gone, and big feet and dogmen aren't, it's a pretty safe bet that they weren't eating these big animals. Predators are dependent upon their prey, which makes them particularly vulnerable to extinctions. That's not to say that these megafauna aren't gone though. There's plenty of megafauna reports from Canada, as well as a critter that you lot have proposed, the Gorp. General consensus is that these things are ground sloths, and honestly, there's a pretty solid argument to be made for it being out there. Ground sloths were incredibly successful, adaptable animals. They got as far north as Alaska and the Yukon, and there's some evidence that they got into Russia. Generalist diets, able to climb, swim, and dig, relatively slow metabolisms. The smaller species would be the perfect candidate to survive the Ice Age extinctions, and the defenses of the group would also make it a hell of a prey item for inner woods monsters. See, one family of ground sloths had a very interesting little trick up their sleeves. Hidden underneath their skin, they had a network of tiny pieces of bone called osteoderms that acted like a set of organic chainmail. We've got some preserved examples of mummified sloth skin from caves in the Andes, and it took a fire axe to successfully cut through it. Add into that the big heavy bones that ground sloths were known to have, and you have an animal that's a dead ringer for the bulletproof monsters that LARPers keep running into. We also know a good deal about the ground sloth behavior, and it further builds onto their survival. Namely, they were pretty territorial animals, digging out massive burrows into the earth that they returned to sleep and shit. Some of the bigger species can make tunnels longer than football fields and wide enough to drive a car through. Gorps, of course, aren't making anything that big, but they'd be hiding away in their territories and keeping their shit in one spot where people wouldn't be likely to find it. And those tunnels would in turn make prime habitat for creatures like crawlers and sasquatch secluded spaces that have stayed warm in winter and cool in summer, hidden away from the earth. Eating the gorp itself? Not very likely. Besides their claws, strength, and armor, the matted, filthy fur would make eating one a poor option. But there's plenty of animals whose shelters are taken over by other creatures, including ground sloth burrows. As it turns out, so gorps probably aren't regular prey items for monsters in the woods, not frequently at least, but they could definitely be a major boon for other cryptids. But there's something else that could very easily feed these monsters brought in by human beings. Pigs. Pigs are honestly fucking terrifying. They regularly weigh almost half a ton. They'll eat a human without hesitation. And if you let them out into the wild, they very rapidly revert into a near feral state resembling their boar ancestors. What's more, they're incredibly common all across the continent. Taking advantage of the abundant food provided by human garbage, and the relative lack of large predators that could stop them. Except, of course, for monsters. A Bigfoot could more than easily kill an even bigger pig. While mystery big cats would be right at home gorging on something fairly similar to their natural prey items, dogmen would be in a similar situation, and crawlers could probably down smaller examples. All of this would in turn start to pressure wild pig populations to grow faster and bulk up more. Selecting for pigs that can grow into absolute monsters too big for anybody to tackle. And just like that, you have an explanation for Hogzilla. And hogs aren't the only animals let out into the continent either. There's quite a few species of deer, sheep, and antelope that escaped from game ranches and went feral. In Florida, you've got pythons and capybaras. The south in general has nutrias, invasive species taking advantage of the relatively open ecosystem of North America to spread are ending up as food for monsters in the woods that did the same thing a few thousand years ago. Next up, dogmen. Long story short, I'm pretty sure that these are much more dog than man. Bears can already get uncannily human-like when they rear up. It's not much of a stretch to figure that an animal adapted for rearing up like a meerkat would be able to match the profile of a dogman sort of creature. 
Funny thing is, there was a group of carnivores that matched the description pretty well. The Amphicyonids, or bear dogs. These animals went extinct due to competition with both wolves and bears. Animals that weren't as big, but had faster rates of reproductions and more generalist diets that let them monopolize food sources. The ancestors of the dogman was probably an animal that bucked these trends. A generalist that stuck the deep forests and stayed relatively small and adaptable. Again, the Ice Age would have limited these things' presence even further. Elephants and sloths and mammoths all kept woodland habitats largely open through their endless eating, which in turn means that the dense forest that you see nowadays would have been a lot rarer. With the extinction of these animals, you had a lot less pressure on the woods until the arrival of European loggers. The beasts in the woods were free to expand their ranges, and the dogmen would have been among them. Big and bulky animals that were largely free to take down moose, wood bison, elk, and of course, other monsters. It's entirely likely the dogmen are a part of the reason why Sasquatches aren't as widespread as they are. Same with other more supernatural spooks. You see something similar in tigers who actively hunt wolves and bears in Siberia. Likewise, big cats will actively hunt other predators whenever they get the chance. The more emphasis on the dog part of dogman could also explain how these things had gone undetected. Big predators like these don't go unnoticed for long, and we've got centuries of experience looking for signs of bears and wolves. But an animal like a dogman could hide through, well, not hiding at all. Its signs and tracks are found, but they look enough like bear or wolf tracks that people don't see them as anything out of the ordinary. Hell, dogmen could also be responsible for various stories of giant wolf monsters, including the Shunkawarakin and other monsters with relatively little description beyond big carnivore that hunt down dogs. Just the same how this hypothetical dogman could have maintained its territories even in the face of canine and ursine competition. I'll speculate on it in a moment. This is a sort of umbrella set of ideas that would apply to large bipedal creatures operating on the North American continent. First off, if they're undetected this long, leave no usual signs such as corpses, poops, dens, etc., then there is some presently unknown variable allowing them to exist undetected. They are not simply well hidden. What this is, I haven't seen any real concrete evidence of. Are they from another dimension, outer space, or do they have some way of cloaking themselves, at will, from modern senses and equipment? Personally, I think these things have to come from somewhere else. Their main populations are not here for a lack of better term, and what we are seeing are probably outlier individuals or groups that have a reason to be in the Pacific Northwest or whatever, be it food, curiosity, or recreation. Think about what kind of humans you'd find deep in the real forest. Think about if your only experience with humans was observing deer hunters, you'd say they didn't have a sustainable population. You'd have no way of knowing they're not representative of how the mainline human population looks or acts, or even how they find themselves 99% of the time. There's just not enough information. Food source. As stated above, I don't think any of them live where they're seen full time. Some certainly seem willing and eager to eat a normal big predator's diet, including humans, but if they are regularly eating animals or plants, here we'd see more signs of them. Intelligence. Without being fictitious, they're at least smart enough to avoid most humans or human surveillance methods, so they're probably above chimps, but they don't use machines or tools of their own, or even ours, that they have access to. The exceptions being skinwalkers who seem to quickly figure out vehicles and electronics, but are 100% hostile and always provoke life or death situations. Their intent, I suspect this varies wildly by the individual. As I've said, I don't think they live here, but I have no idea where they might actually live. It could be underground or alternate universes for all I know. I don't think enough of them are eating here to make food a primary reason to come. To go with the deer hunter analogy again, I think that anything they kill or eat here is a recreational or ceremonial thing that doesn't represent their normal diet or hunting practices. Hostile Actors Skinwalker gets a special mention because they're the only ones in the stories that specifically seem to go into direct confrontation with humans. Although there are scattered stories of Bigfoots or dogmen chasing people, I think this is rare because whatever they're here for, it's not us and they'd rather not be involved at all. Hence why most of them just try to chase humans away. Skinwalkers probably need us for reproduction or cultural reasons or something. Because if you had the option of eating anything humans are a poor choice of prey. Like even polar bears rarely survive a real attempt to kill humans. Shapeshifting is an edge, but not enough of one to make humans a viable long term food source. It's likely that even in the scariest of inner woods creatures, 
human prey is a rarity. There's also something to be said about the fact that those fuckers are the only ones whose stories are all about attacking people because their stories are more often than not being made up to scare people. Cryptids, by their very nature, can't really do much to attack humans in the stories they get told about because it gives them away. If someone supposedly dies to a monster attack, that's something that can be pretty easily verified and usually leads to a posse of hunters sweeping the area and determining if there's nothing there at all. Walkers, on the other hand, are dropped into a community that tends to actively believe that there's weird shit out there and makes little effort to actually verify shit. There's less burden of proof for egg stories so the monsters in them can get away with a lot more. Skinwalkers probably need us for reproduction or cultural reasons or something. Because if you had the option of eating anything, humans are a poor choice of prey. Like even polar bears rarely survive a real attempt to kill humans. Shapeshifting is an edge, but not enough of one to make humans a viable long-term food source. I don't know, I can agree with a lot of this thread, but skinwalkers to me seem, if they're real of course, like something that has evolved to prey on humans, specifically. Their rarity would speak to the fact that this is not an easy or safe lifestyle, but not that it's impossible. Over-specialized predators being rare and vulnerable to extinction at any moment is nothing new after all. Basically, I would think skinwalkers are to humans what those not deer would be the deer, if indeed they're not actually the same thing. Also, it may or may not tie into skinwalkers directly, but to me, the human aversion to uncanny valley faces or movements implies to me that there is, or at least was, some humic mimic predator out there, very possibly another hominid of some sort. The usual explanation that is some sort of aversion to corpses doesn't track for me. Corpses do not move around jerkily or have eyes spaced slightly wrong, for example. If we're gonna write it off as not real, then the only real cryptids are the coelacanth and the extinct but not really extinct eastern cougar. Green text about skinwalkers used to be a lot tamer and ended with everyone alive and no evidence of an attack. Then they kinda got wild over the years and read more like Resident Evil plots these days. Regardless, hearing weird voices in the woods mimicking you is pretty common. There's a crow that calls me racial slurs in the woods behind my house for example, but there's nothing supernatural about him. I don't know about that. I 100% believe there was a human mimic predator at some point, but it probably died out as we got smarter. There's also a lot of diseases that make you twitchy and irrational, rabies being the most notable, but far from the only one. Eh, I was given an example. Next up, not deer. Honestly, there's already plenty of weird fucked up diseases that affect deer that could pretty handedly explain these things. Happens when you evolve to flirt by the way of domesticated bone cancers. But that's not nearly as fun of an explanation. As such, we'll be treated, not deer, as they're described, a creature that mimics deer species in order to hunt. First thing to note with this, there's quite a few options for what exactly a not deer is eating. Deer already can and will eat small animals, and mimicking one would allow this predator to go after not only small game that wouldn't be scared off by what looks like a normal deer, but stuff like coyotes, badgers, hell, with some size estimates I've seen with not deer. I wouldn't be surprised if they could go after shit like cougars or turkeys. Other deer wouldn't be off the menu either. A not deer could use its disguise to lure in horny bucks that see them as either mates or as rivals, depending on whether or not the deer has antlers grown in at the time. However, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that they might eat some plant matter as well. Forward facing eyes aren't actually that big of a factor in determining if an animal's a predator. There was a goat with forward facing eyes alive until a few hundred years ago and crocodiles certainly don't have that kind of eye setup either. Second note, there's probably a distinction to be made about whether or not this is a creature that mimics deer specifically or if it's a general shapeshifter. I know that some stories about crawlers have them be capable of shapeshifting, but what if it's the other way around? Rather than a crawler that can turn into other things, what if it's just a shape that regularly adopted because it's faster and more maneuverable? than the base form, while the not deer is used for stealthier movement. Oh shit, I never actually talked about devil monkeys. Let's fix that. There's actually some precedent for primates in North America. The last native one died out just 30 million years ago. It's entirely possible that some weird fuckers developed that lingered on in the woods, only to expand their range along with the rest of the monsters they live alongside when dense forests started to get more common. I'd even make the argument that they could be behind a number of vaguely similar critters across the continent. Giant monkey monsters in Appalachia and Canada aside, there's also the hypothesis that the Goatman's a weird giant monkey 
I'd wager that it's entirely possible that crawlers are specimens of devil monkeys suffering from mange. But like with the nadir, that's not exactly a fun answer. In general, I'd suggest that crawlers and devil monkeys are cousins of some sort, but they actively compete with each other whenever they meet, feeding as they do on the same things. But this begs the question, how have these things stayed hidden while also being super aggressive? Simple. Drugs. Primates getting hooked on human intoxicants is a known phenomenon across the world. Monkeys developing alcoholism is a problem in both Africa and the Caribbean. We know for a fact that drugs that affect humans sure as hell work the same on other primates. Hell, there's even quite a few stories of Sasquatches raiding marijuana crops. For the devil monkeys, a lot of the major interactions that they have with humans are going to be folks trying to do shit in the woods that they don't want anyone knowing about. Cults, breakaway communities, moonshine operators, weed farmers, and of course, meth labs. None of these groups are going to report seeing something like this around whatever weird shit they're doing. And the devil monkeys are not getting used to people, but associating them with food. Leading to tweaked out monkey monsters following roads towards towns in their quest for anything they can stuff into their mouths in the hopes that it might give them their fix. The disturbing thing about crawlers and me actually is that they might have a small weak bite. If you look at monkeys or chimps who hunt prey, you have to consider that they absolutely suck at it. What this means is that their prey often suffers terribly. Just look at what chimps do to monkeys they catch. What this means for any largest prey that a crawler gets a hold of, a deer caught slipping, or a human, is they won't go painlessly. They'd probably be bludgeoned with those long arms, pulled apart, or gutted, and have to feel the experience of a lot of ineffectual bites. Not a good way to go. In that respect, they're also not too unlike coyotes, so that was a good comparison. To be sure, I'd agree they would be the generalist feeders and spend a lot of time foraging, hunting small game, or licking scum off cave walls or whatever, but I wouldn't underestimate one as a threat either. And they're one of those things where the closer they might be to humans, the worse they get. We all know what humans are capable of. You can just imagine what our subhuman cave dwelling cousins might get into. Agreed, also that they would be blown the fuck out by bears and likely wolves and cougars, let alone Bigfoot and Dogmen. Mind you, chips and monkeys do actually have very powerful jaws, and that's reflected in their skulls. The crawler just doesn't have the necessary attachment points. The head is always small and rounded. No sagittal crest or cheekbones to attach powerful jaw muscles. That said, even chimps are much bulkier than you'd expect them to be. I admit that I may be underselling the crawler, especially if they use shit like flint scrapes or rocks, but they just do not have the equipment to really be a consistent threat to a person. I feel the next up fella to cover is Sasquatches. Best to bring out the big icon boy himself, with him being mentioned with these others. Also, why does it seem dogmen aren't so aggro towards people in their encounters? Seems they can make a real meal out of a person easily, but seem content to spooking them. If I remember correctly from the reports, my guess, long-term interaction with Native Americans, leading to them realizing to stay away from people may be mixed with misinterpreting our bipedal stance as constantly standing tall in a threat display, but probably just realizing that humans are bad news. You see something similar in Africa. Scientists found that just about everything on the savannah runs the fuck away as soon as they hear human voices. Of course, could also be they don't leave witnesses behind when they do attack. But you know what? You're right. Let's talk about Bigfoot, or more specifically, why I think they've started to vanish. First of all, Get the fuck out of here with the they're from another dimension bullshit. You don't need black magic or Ouija boards or whatever the fuck for big hairy dudes to live out in the woods. It's not like we're hurting for potential ancestors. My personal theory is that they either evolved from Paranthropus, a big beefy cousin to Australopithecus that opted for bigger bodies and stronger jaws instead of brain power, or they're an even older branch of the family tree that split off in the Middle East or Eurasia and kept going east. In a way, their migration would have paralleled our own couple million years later. Even as we steadily pushed them out, stories of ogres, wild men, giants. It could have all come from our ancestors meeting these fuckers. Before they pulled further back into spots where they could thrive and we can't. Our ancestors kinda have a history of murder fucking every other human species we meet into extinction. Or absorption into the gene pool. And I doubt that the wild men would have been any different. Thing is, They'd have the advantage of being able to make living in spots where the craziest motherfucker in the Crow Magnum tribes wouldn't see it as worth the risk. What's more, the wild men have absolutely been smart enough 
to know that. And I know that for a very simple reason. Simply put, there's no way that a big ape could survive in such close proximity for so long without being spotted. Gigantopithecus was a giant orangutan cousin that was even bigger than Bigfoot. And that thing died out when it went up against pointy sticks. But a group of people, especially a group of people who've been out in the woods since the ice ages and who don't want to be found, that's another story entirely. The thing about our ancestors is that, well, we don't really know when they became human, so to speak. And I'm not talking about biologically. Tool use isn't something unique to us. Even Paranthropus, the big dumbasses I mentioned earlier, have some evidence suggesting that they might have been making complex tools and have figured out efficient ways of butchering big animals. Now fast forward a few million years, with those apes being forced to figure out new ways of finding food, defending themselves, and keeping warm in the nighttime. When you look at Native American legends about Bigfoot or similar creatures, you get a ton of different interpretations of course, but they tend to have a single common thread, namely that they're more than just animals. You get giants that make armor by spearing mud and stone into their skin, maybe eating rape ogres. But you also get stories that boil down to those guys who lived over there on the other side of the mountains and smoked a bowl with their ancestors. They just happen to be big and hairy. It's the same sort of spectrum of perspectives you get when one culture is mythologizing another. And when you look at the reports, you see more of the same. One that always sticks with me is this report from the Pacific Northwest where a group of Sasquatch were seen gathering kelp from the beach. Not eating it on the spot, but dragging it inland. Kelp's really useful for making things, including medicines. You don't see animals collecting medicine and saving it for later instead of just eating it on the spot. A troop of big apes? Yeah, those are gonna get spotted soon enough. Apes are smart, but they're apes. They leave nests, they leave tracks, they leave their shit and they're dead. But people, people can learn to sneak around. People can cover their tracks and clean up after they're done doing whatever. People can make camouflage and bury their dead. So where are these big bastards now? Why are the sightings trailing off now? I think that extinction's finally catching up to them. Humans as a general rule don't tend to play nice with others. When you look at the fossil records, you get a pretty grim picture. Whether it was just slaughtering our relatives, getting balls deep in enough Neanderthal pussy to observe their entire species into our genome, or a mix of both, we don't know. But wherever Homo sapiens go, any other species of human in the same area gets real dead, real fast. The ancestral Sasquatch managed to avoid this, mainly by living out in the environments that even the craziest bastards among the Cro-Magnum wouldn't consider it worth the risk. They found their spots away from us. They got their peace where they could. In North America, they found a balance. They stayed in their spots and we stayed in ours. But well, nothing lasts forever. You'd not ever read about how absolutely apocalyptic the fall of the Native Americans were. There used to be millions of people living on this continent before the Caucasoids rolled up. Empires, cities, countries. The earliest settlers to sail along the east coast rode of villages so huge they could smell the smoke of fires from the decks of their ships days before they got the land. Just a few centuries later, all of their settlements are just fucking gone, all wiped out by diseases they had no exposure to. Now, what do you think would happen when those diseases spread to another set of tribes who's been living isolated out in the woods for centuries and don't have any real way of contacting one another as their members die off by dozens? from diseases like nothing they've ever seen before. Apes being vulnerable to human diseases and vice versa is nothing new. We all knew about the shit the monkeys could spread to people, but it goes other ways too. In zoos, apes catching diseases from visitors is a serious problem, and it's a threat to modern ape populations too. If Bigfoot's out there, they're not long for this world. We managed to genocide an entire species without even knowing they were there. They hid their dead and buried their brothers even as their bodies broke down from the inside out, under the touch of an enemy that they couldn't even conceive of, much less fight. They pulled back further, hid even deeper, but they ultimately only screwed themselves even more. Isolation leads to inbreeding, which weakened their immune systems even more. I don't think the bits of Sasquatch culture we know about our communication, wood knocking, whooping, all that. I think their funerary rites, the swan song of a dying species.